Thank you. I'm Dr. Douglene Jackson, and I'm here to talk to you about telehealth and OT assessment. So telehealth has been with the pediatric population for more than a decade with evidence supporting efficacy as well as effectiveness. As a service delivery model, telehealth has been implemented in early intervention, school, home, and community-based settings through synchronous and asynchronous means. As more states pass legislation to afford telehealth practice and during the COVID-19 pandemic, practitioners have moved to telehealth and incorporated it into their assessment and intervention practices. The learning objectives of this session will be to discuss ethical considerations and help participants identify effective approaches for assessment through telehealth. So as I said, I'm Dr. Douglene Jackson and in full disclosure, I am a salaried assessment consultant with Western Psychological Services, WPS. I have no additional relevant financial interests or conflicts of interest related to this presentation. So I have a PhD in special ed and early childhood, a master's in OT, bachelor's in rehab services with a concentration in counseling, and I'm a certified assistive technology professional and board certified telehealth specialist. So what I want to start out today with you all is the first to find what telehealth is so we're all on the same page. Telehealth is a means for OT practitioners to increase access and deliver health-related services using information and communication technologies in a setting other than where the client is located. The Accreditation Council for our OT Education in the standards require academic programs to provide entry-level competency in telehealth service delivery for OT practitioners. Additionally, both AOTA and the World Federation of Occupational Therapy have provided practitioners with various telehealth resources, offering practice guidance and ethical considerations for practice. WOFIT defines telehealth as the use of information and communication technologies to deliver health-related services when the provider and client are in different physical locations. They also define occupational therapy as a client-centered health profession concerned with promoting health and well-being through occupation. So occupational therapy practitioners promote health and well-being in a variety of contexts, including the virtual space using telehealth. Occupational therapy practitioners are among those rehabilitation healthcare providers who may use telehealth technologies for service delivery. Potential uses include consultation, assessment, which is the primary focus of this session, client monitoring, supervision, and intervention. So telehealth isn't new to OT, with studies dating back to the early 2000s. What may be new are the current ease of access for provision of services that also bring about the need to be secure in the telehealth space to ensure confidentiality and online safety. So telehealth is an appropriate service delivery model for OT services when in-person services aren't possible, practical, or optimal for delivering care and or when service delivery via telehealth is mutually acceptable to the client and the provider. Telehealth can also be part of a hybrid model wherein some OT services are delivered to a client in person and some OT services are delivered at a distance. So occupational therapy services via telehealth should be appropriate to the individual groups and culture served and contextualized to the occupations and interests of those clients. So as I stated, service delivery can include assessment and that is what will be the focus of what I'll talk to you about for the rest of this presentation. As we focus on practice, we always need to ensure that we are doing so ethically. The same principles that would apply in person are also applicable in telehealth. You still need to obtain informed consent just as you would if the client were coming in person. There are various means of obtaining signatures electronically, so I encourage you to look into them. Privacy and confidentiality are also of the utmost importance as delivering services online pose a different layer of vulnerability. Be sure to follow HIPAA requirements and take the appropriate security measures for your session. 
Being effective at telehealth requires a set of competency in not only our skills as a professional, but also competency with the technology in order to provide effective services. Telehealth is a service delivery model and you can bring your skills to this arena, but be sure to seek guidance from your professional associations and professional development opportunities such as this. You also need to comply with licensure laws and regulations and current OT practice standards. So be sure to review the ethical guidelines put forth by your professional association. I've included the link to the AOTA advisory position for ethics regarding telehealth. You'll find that later on in the resources for this presentation. Now let's move on into assessments. OT assessments should be holistic in nature and consider various aspects of the client, whether they are an infant, child, adolescent, or moving towards adulthood. Information should be gathered from multiple sources, including observation, interviews, review of records where possible, and completion of formal and informal assessments. When completing assessments, occupational therapists consider the various domains foundational to our profession. The main focus of assessments and interventions is function. And we should be assessing contributing factors and those areas where a client is having challenges or presenting with differences that negatively impact performance and participation in occupations. Throughout this presentation, keep in mind when I say client, I am referring to the person seeking services as we as occupational therapists work with clients across the lifespan, including their caregivers. So assessments can be used in a variety of settings, including schools, clinics, hospitals, and community agencies. We use them to help identify client strengths and weaknesses. Assessments are the gateway to intervention and help us to provide client-centered, occupation-based services. The domains of occupational therapy that are the focus of our assessments are listed here. For more detailed information, I refer you to review the AOTA Occupational Therapy Practice Framework, as it will help refresh you on the concepts and was recently updated and published in 2020. Occupations are those meaningful, purposeful and valuable activities that individuals, groups, or populations engage in. Client factors include values, beliefs, and spirituality, body functions, and body structures that reside within the client and influence the client's performance in their occupations. Performance skills are observable elements of action that have an implicit functional purpose. Skills are considered a classification of actions encompassing multiple capacities, body functions and body structures included. And when combined, they underlie the ability to participate in desired occupations and activities. Performance patterns are the habits, rituals, routines, roles used in the process of engaging in occupations or activities. These patterns can either support or hinder occupational performance. Contexts refer to a variety of interrelated conditions that are within and surrounding the client. They include cultural, personal, temporal, and virtual factors. The term environment refers to the external physical and social conditions that surround the client and in which the client's daily life occupations occur. With assessment, we look at all of these domains to identify strengths, challenges, and differences so that we can support independence and improve functioning with various activities of daily living. So consider your roots. What is the foundation of OT? We are rooted in occupation and most concerned with performance, participation, and function. So occupations are the everyday activities that people do as individuals, in families, and with communities to occupy their time and bring meaning, value, and purpose to their life. Occupations include things people need to do, want to do, as well as are expected to do. 
They're categorized as activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living, health management, rest and sleep, education, work, play, leisure, and social participation. The focus of your assessment should be in identifying strengths and challenges as they relate to the above occupations. This can be achieved through direct observation, interview, caregiver report, records review, and performance-based assessments. I know you've been used to doing this probably in person. Now it's time to figure out how you can shift that to the virtual space through telehealth. So as I mentioned, assessment is the gateway to intervention. So without it, you can't proceed. As occupational therapy practitioners, we encounter young children, students, and adolescents who may be struggling with being successful in their roles. Our role is to help identify what strengths and challenges can help to promote function and improve quality of life. We begin our assessments from a holistic view of occupational function. The initial step in the process is the occupational profile which provides an understanding of past experiences and occupational performance history, patterns, interests, values, and needs. I know when I came out of school, the occupational profile wasn't developed yet. So if you've been out for a while, look it up. It's a great resource and it's needed to be included in your assessments. The reasons for needing potential services, strengths and concerns with regards to performing occupations and daily activities, occupational disruption, Supports and, supports and barriers and priorities are the focus of assessment. We then progress to complete an analysis of occupational performance where differences and challenges are more closely explored. Performance is analyzed to determine the supports and barriers while also considering context, performance skills, performance patterns, client factors, and occupational demands, concluding with identifying areas to be targeted through intervention. In addition to other assessments, we might commonly use, we need to look at our clinical observations, work on our interviewing skills, because assessments in the virtual space rely on your present skills, but also you have to develop others because it's a bit different in this virtual space. So as I mentioned before, you wanna be holistic. You wanna look at the whole person. You wanna consider the caregivers, as well as the community where that person resides. We want to have a top-down approach, taking a global consideration of occupational performance, such as their values, their habits, and their routines. You want to be strength-based, not just looking at challenges and barriers. That's why I keep emphasizing strengths and challenges, considering differences, because oftentimes you might get in that tunnel and look only at the negative. That's not what we're here to do with our assessment. We need to be holistic, strength-based, and occupation-centered also. So focus on functional occupational performance and participation. Now your OT assessment should consist of the following, starting with informed consent. I'll go into each briefly before reviewing some assessments available through WPS. So you start with your consent form, as I said, then you need to conduct the records review. You have your intake forms, which give you valuable information prior to your assessment. The interview, which takes place either during the assessment or before. Clinical observations, checklists, and standardized assessments, which are either performance-based or rating scales for the most part. With consent, you need to obtain this in writing for not only the assessment, but also the option to conduct this via telehealth. You may need to alter your current forms to be inclusive of this and be sure to send these through a secure manner. Intake forms can be completed prior to the face-to-face -face component of the assessment. And when I say face-to-face, -face, I mean that virtual component because telehealth is face-to-face. -face you are in person right there before them. So yes, I said face-to-face -face because telehealth is. Traditionally, you might have conducted these in person, had a link on your website, or mailed intake forms to be completed. As stated before, you wanna collect information for your assessment from a variety of sources, 
including the client when able, caregiver, such as parents, guardians, spouses even, and teachers or any other individuals who have a good understanding and knowledge of the client's occupational performance. Your assessment is very much informed by your structured interview. Your structured interview provides that historical perspective, that background information. So it looks at their social history. It looks at their developmental history. Were their developmental milestones achieved on time? Were they delayed? Did they receive any intervention in the past that may either play into what assessment you're choosing? How far back was their last assessment also? So during that records review and that structured interview, you can gather some of that information. You also want to obtain information regarding their medical history. Do they have any previous diagnoses? Have they had any surgeries? Are they taking any medications? Also, you wanna look at that educational history. Are they in school? Is this their first time being in school? Do they receive special education services? Do they have an IFSP, an IEP? Are they in a preschool setting or have they been at home? There are many different options and in the current pandemic, what does that look like? You wanna know what their education now looks like. How are they doing with that? Is it more of a struggle? Are things getting better with them being in a different context? You need to figure all that out and you can gather that through your structured interview. Additionally, you wanna find out about their interests. It helps when you need to engage that client in your assessment process. What do they like to do? What reinforcers can you provide digitally? What reinforcers can that caregiver or e-helper that might be there to facilitate your evaluation have available to promote that motivation for you? You also wanna look at other components. So sensory, do they have issues staying still? Do they have issues seeing themselves on screen even? What about their motor abilities? Are they required to use the mouse to partake in your assessment? Do they have the skill to do that? Also, you wanna find out information about their ADLs, their ID, IADLs, and other occupations. So you can inquire about that through your structured interview. Now, clinical observations are key because not all standardized assessments can be used where you have your manipulatives available or the kit right there. I'll get into that a little later, but your clinical observations based on what you see, what you observe are critical. Can you move away from this screen and have a larger view of your body so someone can demonstrate motor actions back to you? Is the camera able to be moved on the other end with the client so you can view their whole body? What device are they joining from? I'm not focusing a lot on technology, but all of those things are going to be useful to help facilitate your clinical observations. You just don't wanna rely on interview. You want to see performance-based tasks. You wanna be able to see their neuromuscular skills. What's the range of motion yet? Like you can't assess their tone because you can't touch them, but if they move their body certain ways, if you ask the e-helper or caregiver to help facilitate those movements so you can see is there hypermobility in their extremities? Is there hypermobility in the fingers? You can look at all those things to see their motor abilities. You also wanna engage in gross motor activities. What movement can they do? Can you see through the camera if they're playing catch? Can they bounce a ball, different things like that? You'll be violating the standardization if you were to use an assessment that's asking for that, but can you use your clinical observation skills to still get at that? Just think of a kid who you can't sit to complete an assessment. How else can you gather this information? You engage them in different tasks. So you can do the same thing through telehealth. Also with fine motor skills, what's available in that person's environment? Do you need to mail a kid out to have those things and manipulatives available so that you can observe their fine motor prehension skills, their fine motor coordination abilities. Ask, do they have a shoe nearby to see how they tie their shoe? Ask, do they have clothing with the fasteners that they're being required to complete in their particular occupations? With visual motor integration, there are assessments that you can use your cameras to maybe angle down so you can see them draw and write. Maybe you can mail the protocols out. And then with sensory, 
that interview that gives you some information, but also your observations throughout your assessment help feed your impression that you're going to walk away from your assessment with to develop your report, to be comprehensive in what you've observed. Informal assessment checklists provide a valuable record for documenting a child's current functioning and even monitor progress in a variety of performance areas. Such resources might help an occupational therapist identify developmental or performance strengths and differences in various functional areas. Formal assessment checklists might be required by your district if you work in a school setting, your facility, or even funding sources. So these can be valuable to inform your evaluation report, but standardized measures are also great to help provide information based on norm and criterion reference assessments. So you need to see what's required for your particular setting. Is that still accessible to you and appropriate in the telehealth space? And if not, what else is available to you? Now I wanna talk a little bit about top-down versus bottom-up assessments. Bottom-up assessments tend to examine small separate components of a client's skills or occupational performance components. By contrast, top-down assessments take a global perspective, focusing on the client's participation in their living context to determine what's important and relevant. Standardized assessments are another component and they primarily include performance-based assessments or rating scales. And I'll go into some of that for you all. Performance-based assessments require the client to complete specific tasks, often using a standardized set of objects. With telehealth, some have mailed out kits to caregivers if they require specific manipulatives for administration. Sanitation is key when these are returned just as when used in person in clinical, educational, or community settings. Rating scales are forms completed by parents, caregivers, teachers, and others who know the client. Self-assessments completed by the client are also appropriate when able. They're available through online platforms of assessment publishing companies and can be sent electronically for completion or you can mail the paper forms back. You just need to know what's available to you and how's the best way for you to get this completed for your telehealth assessment. You might have some limitations based on your particular setting, regulations, or even the assessment itself. So be sure to problem solve those things, reach out to the publishers, see how they can help facilitate that and there are valuable resources already located on many websites. Performance-based assessments, as I mentioned, require you to complete tasks using standardized objects. So you have kits. Oftentimes we know them because they have the blocks, the strings, beads, anything like that, that you may need to perform those tasks. With telehealth, you may have to mail that out. Sanitation, once again, I wanna emphasize that is key. Here I have on the screen the goal. It's a goal-oriented assessment of life skills. It emphasizes the motor components of a child's participation in home, school, and community. There are seven activities broken up into fine as well as gross motor skills. So in this kit, you'll find utensils, a lock, a paper box, even a notebook for those fine motor activities. With the gross motor task, you need clothes. So there's some shirts in there. There's a ball for you to play with and there's a tray to carry to look at that bilateral coordination. The goal also has intervention targets to assist with treatment planning and intervention activities. And a lot of assessments, whether you know it or not, they do have extra books and resources that help you with your intervention piece, right? Assessment isn't only about let's see your strengths, let's see your challenges and you're done. Most likely you'll be having that client on your caseload and providing direct services. So if there are intervention tools to help you with your treatment planning, be sure to look at them. And the goal has um, some, so you're trying to figure out what interventions you might use. You can refer to that intervention targets to help you generate those ideas. However, keep in mind that your session should be client-centered and enlist the caregiver and client in joint planning and decision-making through the use of coaching approaches when you're using telehealth.
Now, rating scales, I already mentioned, are those that you're going to send out to the client. What I have pictured here is my bookshelf at WPS because I already told you all I'm an assessment consultant here. So I have access to all their materials. And I highlight the ones that are most relevant to occupational therapists. And these you can send out electronically through our online evaluation system. There's a video you can watch on the website. I'm not going to play it here, but you can reach out to us or just visit platform.wpspublish.com. And it walks you through how to actually use a rating scale, how to set up your account, how to send it out electronically, because that's what we always wonder, how am I gonna get this to this caregiver? It will be generated from your email. It will go out to them. Make sure you let them know, hey, I'm going to send you an assessment. Please complete it and send it back to me. You want that done in a timely manner. Otherwise, it's going to hold up your documentation. These assessments can be sent out electronically and returned back electronically so that you can score them. And when you use them through the online platforms, it generates a report for you that you can copy and paste directly into your documentation, your electronic medical record system. So the WPS online evaluation system can be found, as I said, at platform.wpspublish.com. And you can see the short video there. We also have others on our Facebook page and our main website, wpspublish.com. Other publishers also have videos that demonstrate how to use their products as well. So reach out to them. Don't feel as though you have to figure this out on your own. We have several assessment consultants beside myself who are always happy to assist you and even walk you through this process. We can also set up free virtual sessions with your organizations. So check what training and resources are available from each publisher, each organization. Many are pivoting right now to support clients practitioners just like you and I, so that we can be able to administer assessments through telehealth. So the first thing I wanna talk about is sensory. If you're not already using it, look into the sensory processing measure and the sensory processing measure preschool. The update is actually coming out soon. The SPM and SPMP are integrated systems of rating scales that enable assessment of sensory processing issues, praxis, and social participation. They're used in the educational, clinical, and research settings. They function as a screening tool or how we primarily use them as a di diagnostic instrument. So it can help determine eligibility for special education and related services. It can help you plan IEPs or IFSPs consistent with the strengths and weaknesses identified and also help you measure progress. The SPM results presented from your reports are going to be in terms that can be understood easily by parents. So it kind of eliminates some of that jargon, which I'll point out on the next slide. Spanish forms are also available. We want to be culturally appropriate, culturally sensitive and responsive in that we have tools that are in the languages that are best understood by our clients. These are available in print, or through the WPS online evaluation system. The sensory processing measure preschool is for two to five year olds and is appropriate for those five year olds who haven't started kindergarten yet. The sensory processing measure is ages five through 12 years old. And with the update that's coming out in 2021, the age range is actually going to expand lower into that early childhood range and to the further end through adulthood. So I'm very excited to see that. If you're not already using the SPM Quick Tips, it's there to help provide those interventions that align with the results from these two measures. So I like to pair all of that together because once my assessment is scored, I can go back and see which items were identified as strengths, challenges, and then tailor individually what recommendations, and I don't have to think of these things all on my own, they're already built into that online platform for you to check that box, print it out, and you can return to it frequently so that you can update progress, you can modify recommendations, or just give a small bit to start with, and then increase and change them out. So as I mentioned, the SPM P and SPM 
use terms that are easily understood. So when we're talking about proprioception and vestibular function and praxis, there are terms that we pivot to be more appropriate for others to understand what it is that we're talking about. We OTs are notorious for our jargon that no one understands. So helping to make that language more client friendly is key. So on the left column you hear, you see here social participation, vision, hearing, touch, taste and smell, body awareness, balance and motion, planning and ideas. These are the eight scales assessed by the SPMP and SPM respectively. So as I said, we use lay terms to avoid that jargon, helping others readily understand the terminology and connect it back to function. And I don't wanna leave assessment without reminding you of intervention. I went in detail a little bit to let you know that the quick tips helps you with that process. It's a great companion tool to not only help with writing your recommendations for your report, but also to help you guide those interventions. You can find suggestions, tasks, and activities that are designed to help children cope with their sensory-based challenges. It's designed to be implemented by a range of persons involved in that child's care including parents, teachers, grandparents even. So when you make those recommendations, you can include them in your report by pulling them from that quick tips. So suggested um, organizations are there where you can filter down to just those problem areas that had the higher numbers of concern and look for patterns as well related to specific systems such as touch, vision, and hearing. So it's similar to other assessments that are out there, but it removes that jargon. You can pair it with this quick tips to help you tailor your suggestions on your assessment, one, your report from your assessment, and then feed into your interventions to be implemented by not just you, but others who are with that child in their natural environment. Next, I wanna to talk to you about the developmental profile. The DP4 recently was updated and came out. There's an updated nationally representative sample, and it's a valuable instrument for any setting in which an efficient measure of areas of functional development is needed. You can compare how the individual is functioning relative to their peers. You can measure progress, comparing growth scores from repeated administrations, even compare assessment results from multiple respondents. And what's nice is that you can use the results to identify skill deficits and possibilities for intervention. The DP4 includes clinical cases as well as Spanish language forms because we want to be culturally responsive and provide you with those tools that can help those who do not have English as their primary language to complete these rating forms. With the update, the age range has also been expanded, which I like because it's birth, all the way now through 21 years, 11 months. So for those of you who are working with those transition age adolescents, this is a tool for you. For those of you who are working in the early intervention space, you can start this from birth. And what's nice is that you can use growth scores to track progress over time. Oftentimes we have assessments that are performance-based and someone might plateau out and you're not continuing to see progress because of the way that item is set up. But when you're using a rating scale, you can have those who are familiar with that person give you that information, that feedback, and look at the first time you administer it, all the way now from birth through 21 years, 11 months. Um, there are two additional forms now. So there's a teacher checklist that you can send out. So it's not just a caregiver. And you also have clinician rating forms. So you can put your feedback in based on what you're observing. And they're the same questions that everybody else is putting their responses to. So all of these can align together so you can see variances if that's what's going on where they're able to do something in the school setting or in the home setting, but it's not translating across different environments. They're not generalizing those skills and you'll be able to see that. And oftentimes we see when we're in particular settings providing that intervention one-on-one, -on -one, someone might be able to perform that skill. But once we give that teacher a checklist or that caregiver a checklist, 
it comes back saying, no, they're not doing that. So that's when we know that they have the skills. We need to start working on that generalization piece. And this assessment helps you identify that. With the update, terminology was also changed to reflect changes in technology, which is always advancing, as well as general society. Items are also gender neutral, culturally sensitive, and inclusive of children who are deaf or hard of hearing. So this update for the developmental profile, if you weren't already using the third edition, the fourth edition is out and you get all these added benefits. Now, those who have used it might be familiar with the domains assessed through here, but the DP4 is a well-established measure of development and functioning. And as I mentioned, the age range is expanded to 21 years, 11 months. So the key areas identified here that are also outlined in IDEA provide a comprehensive assessment of physical, adaptive behavior, socio-emotional, cognitive, and communication skills. The DP4 is available in print and digitally through the WPS online evaluation system. And I touched on some of the forms, but when you order a kit, you'll get the manual as well as the different forms you see listed here. So there's a parent caregiver interview, a parent caregiver checklist, a teacher checklist, and that clinician rating form. So those four forms are all written at the fifth grade reading level and they're available in Spanish versions too. The next assessment I want to introduce you to, which is a rating scale that may might not be familiar with, but I use this as a go-to before telehealth. Oftentimes I cannot sit a client down who may have behavior challenges, may have difficulty attending to tasks, or following directions or returning demonstrations, but you can give an ABIS-3 to a teacher, a parent, someone who knows that child, and they can give you information that provides those numbers oftentimes that we're asked for to feed our insurance companies or our school districts or early intervention to see that change as well as identify those delays. So adaptive behavior refers to ways an individual meets their personal needs, as well as deals with natural and social demands and expectations in their environment, consistent with their age, educational attainment, and culture. These abilities and skills enable a person to function effectively and independently daily at home, school, work, and the community, which we see as a challenge for those who are often referred to occupational therapy. So as occupational therapists, these include all of the domains that we address through assessment and intervention, including occupation, client factors, performance skills, performance patterns, and context. The Adaptive Behavior Assessment System 3rd Edition provides a complete assessment of these adaptive skills across the lifespan from birth through 89 years of age. So the ABIS-3 uses a top-down approach where you'll be given a global adaptive composite for all of these different areas. Under the conceptual area, you see you have communication, functional pre-academics, and self-direction. Under social, you have leisure as well as your social skills. Under practical, you have community use, home and school living, self-care, health and safety, as well as motor and work. So if you think from our OT domains, our roots, the things that we look at, this is a great checklist that aligns with those things that you can send out electronically, get that feedback, and then use your clinical observations to probe, to probe further and see their performance. So I love to send this one out and I've been using it before I came to WPS and found it very valuable. The, two children's hospitals that I worked with, the one that I opened, I was able to get this ordered for us. And it's a tool that many didn't know about, but have adopted into their practices because it gives you valuable information. The ABIS-3 also has an intervention planner. So I wanna remind you about that. 
you can use it to help identify those recommendations for your assessment report. It's a companion resource that links those specific intervention to the deficits that you identify from the items when it's returned back to you. So it helps you, as I said, provide those recommendation based on those areas identified as a concern. So as you can see, we have a variety of products to meet your assessment needs. And not just WPS only, other publishers have some that you can look at and see how they work for this telehealth space. So I advise you to also look into other publishers too, but reach out to our assessment consultants to help us guide you. Look to our resources that we have available to you online because some assessments have online versions and others don't. So you need to be aware of which ones can be used in the space and which ones cannot. What's the guidance? Refer to your professional associations and each publisher has a section on their webpage where they list guidance from your profession, documents that you can consult. With WPS, we're also a one-stop shop, so we can provide you with paper-based assessments, but if they're not published through us, you'd have to go directly through the other publisher. So visit our website at wpspublish.com to learn more about our assessments. And here, what I have on this page are some of our autism assessments, because although we as occupational therapists do not diagnose, we can be instrumental in helping formulate that diagnosis. I remember years ago, I went and got trained in the ADOS too. And many are like, oh, we don't diagnose as OT, so why are you doing that training? I can conduct an ADOS too, take my report and recommendations and give them to someone who can diagnose. If you're working in an interprofessional team, you might divide different things up and an OT can take that component of the ADOS too and administer it. The MIGDIS-2 is an interview-based assessment that is rooted in sensory practices. So I actually like this one. It's the Montero Interview Guidelines for Diagnosing the Autism Spectrum. And there's more information on our website. If you're curious, reach out and see, because we as OTs can help be instrumental in getting children to get their diagnosis for autism. We find that there's still delays. Resources can be a challenge. And oftentimes parents come to us and the first thing they talk about is their sensory challenges. And we as OTs don't wanna be in our tunnel and only just address that sensory and not look at the whole picture. We oftentimes are on the front line for early intervention. We can do screenings. Are we sending out the MCHAT so that someone can complete that and identify those red flags and start that process to get evaluated? We can administer rating scales similar to some of these that are on here for screening and assessment, including the CARS-2, which is the Childhood Autism Rating Scale, the ADIR, the Autism Diagnostic Interview Revised, the SRS-2, Social Responsiveness Scale, second edition, and the SCQ, Social Communication Questionnaire. So OTs are on that front line. We are instrumental in diagnosis, even though we don't diagnose formally, but we can gather that information, provide a comprehensive report, send these rating scales out, conduct an interview, and help that client get the appropriate diagnosis they need so that they can then get that early intervention and those interventions that are most appropriate for what we're seeing as concerns and capitalizing on their strengths. So at WPS, we provide you with assessments, training, and resources. Whether you're needing to complete assessments in person or remotely, we're here to support you. We believe in unlocking potential, not just for your clients, but for practitioners just like you as well. Reach out to the various publishers to get support and access resources on how you can administer assessments through telehealth. Think back to the beginning slides that I put forth here. You want to begin with that consent. Make sure you get consent for your evaluation and to use it through the telehealth space. Your report should also include a statement saying that that's how the evaluation was conducted. You wanna conduct your own records review. Do you have access to those things? Can they send them to you in a secure fashion so that you can see that? How are you sending out your intake form so that you can get them beforehand to inform how you're going to approach your evaluation? Your interview, are you going to do that through 
in person? Are you going to do that once they get on screen with you? Are you going to send out a rating scale where they can write their narrative there for you? There's many different ways you can do an interview, but those structured interviews, once you get them on the screen with you, is going to be instrumental to provide you that history that you're going to need. Identify those interests that are of value to that client so that we can be holistic and occupation-based. Your clinical observations are going to be key. What can you see through the screen? Move away from sitting directly right here. How can you see your full body to provide those demonstrations that are needed to engage that client? What checklists do you currently use that are appropriate? And what standardized assessments that are performance-based or even rating scales fit well to this telehealth space considering how they were standardized? So inclusion, in conclusion, sorry, I just want to point you to one key area of our website that will give you the most information on telepractice. It contains content regarding our assessment. It contains videos to help you get up and going. There are many resources available there too through our telepractice 101 page. And the web address is listed here. It's pages.wpspublish.com forward slash telepractice hyphen 101. So as I mentioned before, we believe in unlocking potential, not just for your clients, but for practitioners just like you as well. Reach out to us as publishers, reach out to other publishers, but I wanna let you all know that I'm an occupational therapist and I'm happy to be able to support you, to give you those resources, provide that training and help you choose the best assessment and learn how to do it with fidelity so that we can demonstrate the distinct value and effectiveness of occupational therapy in this telehealth space. The next few slides just contain resources and when you download the handout, you can click on those links. So AOTA has many that are out there. I referenced their position paper on ethics as well as telehealth in general. You want to be sure you follow the state statutes, regulations, and guidance by regulatory boards. That resource is there too. There's a snapshot of current telehealth applications in occupational therapy. So if you're curious and only think, oh, I'm only seeing it with adults or I'm only seeing it early in early intervention, telehealth is not new. We've been using it for a while. We've just been afforded more opportunities to be reimbursed for it. And that's why you're seeing the tick up for that. Um, AOTA has created many telehealth resources and decision guides, which I'm seeing very helpful for many. Um, they even have one tailored just for the virtual school-based services of telehealth. So be sure to check that out too. And as I mentioned previously, I am an assessment consultant with WPS. Reach out to us at consults at wpspublish.com. We're going to open it up for any questions and answers that you may need from me right now regarding my presentation or anything that I mentioned. And I'm always here to support you. So I want to thank you for taking the time for being in this session. You can reach me at djackson at wpspublish.com or search for me on social media at Dr. Doug Lane. So once again, thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation and gained some valuable knowledge from it. Thank you.